Welcome. We are uh, here today to speak to you about the Open 21 Dynamic Screener. Uh, welcome to PressCon. I am Catherine Still, Executive Director of ELBA 21, which is a research and development program for the assessment of ELs, and we're based at Crest. We are delighted to be here today to tell you about this innovative assessment and how we partnered with state education agencies and national experts to design the first online, standards-aligned screener with multiple student stopping points that is fair, accessible, and rigorous. First, I'd like to introduce my colleagues. I have Michelle McCoy, who's our assessment design manager at ELBA 21. We have Eun Hee Kum, who is a research scientist at Crest, and then Mark Hansen is our lead psychometrician at ELBA 21. So the ELBA 21 Dynamic Screener was, is the result of the collaboration of 10 states under the ELBA 21 Enhanced Assessment Grant. The research, design, and development of the screener results from years of collaboration with state education agencies, their educators, and national experts in English learner assessment, instruction, equity, and evaluation. The screener is the initial assessment in our system and is taken by students as young as four years old as they prepare to attend K-12 schooling. For some of the youngest students and even some of the older students, this is their first experience with both school and assessment. The point of the screener is to determine whether a student is an English learner and would potentially benefit from ELD instructional support. If, based on a survey of the languages the student experiences at home, state policy indicates the student may be an English learner, then the student takes an ELP screener. The screener meets federal requirements for identification of English learners by assessing them in the four domains of listening, reading, speaking, and writing. And it aligns to ELPA 21's rigorous ELP standards and corresponds to common core ELA and math practices, as well as those in the next generation science standards. So I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Michelle, oops, who is going to talk to you about design and test administration. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Kat. So I have the privilege of talking about the design itself as test administrators, or TAs, which I will say a lot by accident, when I, so I want you to know TA means test administrator, and talk about how the screener kind of came to be and what is different about it. So the benefits of our screener is that our goal was to reduce testing time. And in one of the more conflicting things about assessment is teachers, educators, parents, everybody wants the shortest possible test. Make the test shorter. But now let's continue that phrase to, but it has to be really discerning and we have to get really, really good results. So can't be totally short. And so this is where we're trying to balance the what we want to do what's best for children who are being tested, yet get the best results, and that requires some length. So we are talking about a screener here with multiple stopping points to contrast to most of the commercially available off-the-shelf screeners which are on paper, and they go until they hit a point where they can no longer answer questions. And what happens is many times students will shake their heads or just wave their hand, and they're finished. So we put in some stopping points, and our results come out basically the same day for the majority of students, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and we'll talk more about who that doesn't happen for in a moment. And then we also uh, provide alternate formats. We have a full paper pencil screener with uh, also a large print version of that paper pencil available. And we have what I think may be the first braille version screener. And so that, that way we can reach out to the populations uh, in our states that do not use any technology whatsoever, including TAs who don't use any technology, and students who are blind or have low vision. And um, as mentioned, the vast majority of our screeners are screened using the online version. So this presentation does talk about online screening rather than the paper, pencil, or braille just to clarify, because some administration properties are a bit different with those versions. So this is a bit busy, but I wanted to talk in three steps. Our screener is three, or kind of three A and B steps, and we're gonna start with the leftmost side, which is starts with the HLS, or a home language survey. This is the indicator that a parent or guardian fills out to indicate the student may be an English learner. This is uh, standard across the states, but the form itself is not standardized. What happens is if a student on whatever indicator that state or the district uses 
indicates a language other than English in the home, that's the basic general property, will proceed to a screener. If the parent answers no on all of the questions or some sort of subset for a decision, the student is considered to be English only or more appropriately that they may be bilingual but they do not need to be assessed for EL services. And if yes, they proceed to step one of our test. All right, so step one's purpose. It's a very short step that introduces the student to the test items format and what they look like, sound like on the test. It's what they'll encounter later when they're being scored. Also, it introduces the students to technology because this is a technology-based student um, test for students who are the majority kindergartners or first graders, because that is the majority group of students going into English learner status and are being screened for such. But it does happen K-12. We want to see if they have technologically technological ability to be able to work the mouse alone, point and click, drag and drop. And as we mentioned, they might be four years old because they're entering ahead of time, pre-registering for school some months in advance before they ever even enter kindergarten. And during this step, the test administrator will determine the student has or doesn't appear to have that tech ability. And again, although we may mainly screen kinder and first graders, you can have a student arrive in the ninth grade without enough tech ability to do this. They could be coming from a place where they have not been in school, where the tech infrastructure just hasn't been involved in school or at home where they would have this practice. So we have um, an orientation style step. It gets them used to the test items and it practices all four domains, reading, writing, listening, and then speaking. And um, during that time, the TA is tasked via the test administration manual and scripts to determine, because they're actually gonna make a decision whether this test will uh, continue, whether or, and whether or not the student is going to use the technology on their own or not later in the test. All right, and so a small number of students may end up being non-participants. And again, I mentioned a moment ago, sometimes they'll, they'll shake you off, like, I'm done, I, I can't continue. That could be a question one during practice. They just, they, they aren't prepared that day to test, which is one of the harder things about entering school. Welcome to our school, we're so happy you're here, take a test. So we try to make it as gentle as we can, yet it's critical we learn this information to provide the best education for the students in, in these schools. And so a total lack of engagement in that practice test, and we've actually defined it as the student participated in less than a single Question, K-12, just one question and we'll keep going. But if even one question can't be answered, we stop and we actually have the TA make a decision on a scoring screen. The student is a non-participant and will not continue. So if that happens, that will end the test and the student will get a non-participant independent student report. So the time, you know, we didn't use it to test, but it's not wasted. Something still comes out that says, we attempted the screener. However, the scores are zeros. All right, so happily, most students do move on to step two, which again is determined by the TA. If they click the non-participant, the test just ends. Within three minutes, that score report of zero comes out. But if the step continues and they don't refuse, it moves on to what internally is called step 2A, and that is a speaking task of four items that's the same task type that the student practiced right before step one ended if they were participating. So we introduce the speaking task in the, the recording device, et cetera, right before the test either ended. So then the very next thing they do is probably the most intimidating part of the test at that point which is to speak into a microphone and answer four questions. Very scary. So um, that is hand scored right away. Let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about this first though, which is that if the student successfully has made their recordings, they are given the opportunity to review and then the test automatically moves to the next step, which is going to be machine scored test items. There we go. So, the 
purpose of step two is to get a proficiency determination for the majority of students because we do have three proficiency levels emerging for those entry level slash lower proficiency students progressing which is the majority of kiddos who score into progressing. They're, they're not quite proficient, they can benefit from some ELD classes, but they're not at the beginning either. And then the proficient students, they won't end up being determined as ELDs. So as the test is proceeding through the items, the students are actually be, they're being scored as we go. So back to that speaking test. The student does the four items. The TA is actually then asked to hand score those items, we call it on the fly. So this was a bit of worry and consternation uh, from the TAs being, you know, having trepidation about you're asking me to score this right now, etc. But what we did is we provided a lot of training materials and calming emails and don't worry, it's a two-point item and it's great. So, and the neat part about it is we were able to choose a task type that's not the same question for every grade, but has the same rubric and the similar four items through 12th grade or kindergarten. So, once you learn the rubric, you've learned the rubric. So, then they basically the student is turned away to maybe do a little enriching material, coloring, coloring's good, word search, and the TA has the student computer. And this, by the way, is also unprecedented. Usually a test administrator is never allowed to touch and score something on an operational test. So they actually put the scores in right then. They have four scoring screens. They can click back to rehear that recording. It's like a helicopter flew by and they couldn't hear the <laughs> sample. And so for, then they can re-listen, fast forward, click in their scores. The minute that's done, the student has recorded and reviewed, the TA has scored an input two, one, or zero, it locks those in. So the speaking task in that step is already totally scored, which is how it's able to contribute to the overall score of the step at, after this point. So we have taken care of the speaking domain, and um, then we move on. If the student has started step two, they will continue step two. All right. So. I just talked about this, so I'm going to skip ahead on this one. All right, so now we've moved to the machine scored items in the domains of listening, writing, and reading. Speaking is done. And essentially, the student at this point can work independently. Remember back when the TA made the decision? Yes, the student will work independently, or the TA will help through the rest of the test based on those of what they've observed. So the student, they can get up and walk away and the student can work alone. And the TA has a TA screen so they can tell what number the kiddo is on, if they're staring at the screen on number seven and not moving, et cetera. So they can watch the student progress or they're sitting adjacent to the student and working the mouse at the instruction of the student. All right, and that, that scary hand scoring is done. All right, so our stopping point at step two. So. When you get to the end of step two, as I mentioned, behind the scenes, the scoring engine's been working this whole time. So when you reach the end of step two, K through 12, the computer has already decided if the student's going to move on. The minute they click in the right one, the final answer. Now, one thing I forgot to say is students can skip any question they want. They could actually skip 100% if they wanted. Of course, their score's going to be lower, <laughs> but it is actually never required on our screener to force the kid to guess because we actually want to see what they can do rather than the of course. All right, so for a small bit of students, let's see what happens. And help them push the right button. We get this uh, calculation. And again, if that test stops for the step two students, it determined the, there is just not a way that they're going to be proficient, even if they got a few more right, or, and you'll hear more about this in a moment, um, they're not going to make it to proficient. Again, when that test is submitted, the ISR re re um, appears in the reporting system in just minutes. So there's no waiting for the majority of students. If there was some sort of power outage or some ticket issue, it might delay it you know, a little bit more, but those results are in. That student is ready to be placed in classes. All right. So we made it to step three, 
Now again, in all grades K-12, this is the lower percentage of students overall being screened that will go on. And what it is, is it's the students who are high progressing, so they have a potential of being proficient. And then the really high students who just whiz through that test probably on their own, and they're ready for step three. All right, so the one bit of added information about step three is that there are now more hand scoring for writing and speaking. So that means they're gonna to go to a central scoring vendor. We did not wanna ask the TAs to just score everything and get on the fly. So this part will go to a vendor if the student makes it through those items. Now if they skip them, it'll end the test and the score will appear right away. So, we can talk about that. The purpose of step three is gonna differentiate between those kiddos who are your high-end progressing students and those who are proficient as determined by Open 21's um, scores, you know, prep scores. And essentially, what will end up happening is those students who are determined to be proficient are not designated then as ELs. They do not need the additional services. Step three is about 18 to 28 items in all four domains. They, they kind of go in groups, but it actually has to do with the items are getting harder as the test goes on. So it, they're chunked by getting more and more difficult. And then sometimes students even at that level will just start saying no. And again, that's okay, they just can skip forward and submit the test. Again, it's not required that they put in answers just because they made it to step three. <laughs> and again, just like before, these students may be working on their own because their, their tech ability isn't interfering. We never want to test their ability to do technology to, as indicating English language proficiency. No. All right. And so then just an overall look at what I just talked about. Step one is an orientation. We check through the headset, the microphone. We take practice items that look just like the items they're going to see on the real test. And then the TA decides continue, not continue, help, no help. And it's all one-on-one. Step two A is that speaking task that's on the fly score. It's also one-on-one, -on -one, required to be one-on-one. -on -one. Then we get into the meat of the test where the student may be working alone, they may be speeding through the items, or they may do three, four, five and just hit a wall where it got too difficult, and that's when the TA can be watching, go over and check in with the student, and then either ease them forward or show them, you know, oh, if you need to skip that one, let's click this button. The student clicks the button and the test will end. So I hope that that Rather quick overview was great because now we're going to get into the meat of the next part of our presentation. So, I will bring up Pat. Thank you, Michelle. You've seen how our screener functions now and how the students and test administrator experience the screener. So, now we're going to take a look under the hood. Our team had to balance numerous competing criteria, as Michelle mentioned, in developing this test fairness to students, reliability of results, reduction of test administration burden, and rigorous standards and expectations. Mark and then he will share the statistical analyses they designed and performed to optimize the placement of the step two cut score. They also, or step two cut point. Um, they will also share early returns from the field and talk about next steps. We will have time for discussion and questions at the end of the session. Mark, or We are going to talk about our simulation-based procedure for determining stopping rules. Uh, our stopping rules is based on the total growth score that can be earned at the end of the step two. And um, for the screener, we want our screener to provide high accuracy placement decisions while minimizing the burden on students and then test administrators. Given these competing concerns, we conducted a simulation study in order to determine the step two stopping rules. For data generation, uh, the true score distributions for uh, the simulated students were based on the characteristic of the population skill scores distributions of the students <laughs> that administered 
the operational screener in 2074. And from these true scores of distributions, we generate a scale scores for 10,000 students for each grade level. And true classification were obtained by the scores of the true scale scores and assign the domain level proficiency and determine the overall proficiency levels. And using item parameter and then true scale scores, we generated item response data for each of the simulated students. Then we obtain scale to score and classifications by applying the Alpha Premium operational scoring procedures under these test uh, three test conditions. The, in the first conditions, we were looking at the true test, and the classification is based on the items only from step two. And this condition allows us to examine what would be the result if the students stop after step two. In the second conditions, uh, the classification were based on the full length test, which contains items from both step two and step three. And this condition allows us to investigate the research while students were proceed to step three. And the last condition, the classification were based on the full test second version, which has the item from both step two and with the maximum scores on the step three items. And this allows us to see the highest possible result uh, for the student if student proceeds to the step three. Uh, for example, uh, this table shows the true scale score distribution that we use to generate the scale score for kindergarten and in grade one. And this table shows the proportion of simulated students whose true status fall into each of the emerging progressive and proficiency levels. And as you can see, the kindergarten and the grade one has really small portion of the students who, could, who are proficient in truth. And this trend is uh, changed up to grade six which means the proportion of proficient students increases up to grade six, and it again decreases the proportion of the proficient students. This table characterizes the true proficiency levels in a very simplistic way. To determine an optimal stopping goal for each grade, we looked at the four criteria. And we also utilize the visualization, visualization of these four criteria. The first one is distribution of the overall true proficiency level. And the second one is distribution of the student whose estimated overall performance level was classified as proficient under the three scoring design. And then proportion of current classification within each step two role score group. And lastly, we looked at the proportion of current classification for the whole group after applying all the possible stopping rules. And this plot shows the distribution of the true proficiency status for uh, across the step two role scores. And you can see that around point seven, we start to see a small proportion, small proportion of students are progressing, and between seven to twenty-four, and when you look at the point fourteen and twenty-four, we can see that the students are more likely to be the pro progressing between the point fourteen and twenty-four. And we can see that those students with a score below 24 can be proficient in truth. 
let's move on to E. Yeah, this black dotted line shows that the points that uh, students who did two score is uh, whose raw score is below 24 is not proficient at all interest. Uh, this shows the distribution of students who classify that proficiency under three testing conditions and who are proficient in truth. And you can see that the black dotted line indicates that students with score less than 24, they are not classified as proficient. And this implies that if the students has a score below 24, then the decision made after step two would not be changed by their performance under step three. And now we look at the overall proficiency classification accuracy for short task. This plot shows the consistency between the true student proficiency status and then the, their classification based on the scores up to step two. And as you can see, the black line shows the two level classification, which means proficient and non-proficient. And then the red line shows the classification accuracy in three levels of proficiency. Uh, emerging, progressing, and proficient. And you can see that overall, in two level classification, the classification accuracy is pretty high, up to 24. And we can see that the point in the red line drops to around 0.7 near the raw score of 14. This implies that there is some challenge in differentiating between the progressing students and the proficient students. This one shows the overall classification accuracy for the full, for the full test. This shows the consistency between the true uh, proficiency status of the students and their classification based on the full test, which is uh, based on the items from both step two and step three. And the classification accuracy for the full test shows pretty pretty similar trend as the classification accuracy for each root test that we saw in the previous slides. And the only difference is that after above 24 points, the full test has higher classification accuracy in differentiating students between the proficient, non-proficient, or in three level classifications. The same story is here. Uh, we, just to be safe, we also looked at the uh, consistency between the classification based on the short test and the full four test and we can see that we can see that the trend is pretty much similar from the previous plot, and we can see that the decision based on the step two item information made a similar result conclusion as to the full test. Now, take a look at the estimated proportion of correct classification by stopping. Overall, the whole proportion of correct classification is really high. And specifically, in two-level classification, 
the proportion of correct classification is about 0.9, and with the three lower classification, the proportion of correct classification is about 0.8. So we are pretty sure that we are making uh, quite accurate decisions, even if they stop after step two. Uh, step two. And based on this proportion of correct classification, we can come up with three potential cut scores. We first looked at the 23, 24, and 27. Since they have the same proportion of correct classification, we need a little bit more information to identify better stopping points. So to identify better stopping rules, we can further examine the impact of the stopping rules, such as percent of students who will stop after step two, and then a predictive average test scores at each cost scores. These a plot shows the percent of students who would stop after step two at each cut scores. And this blue dotted line shows the proportion of students who would exit given the two possible cut scores, 23 and 24. And we can see that there is 6% difference in the student, a percent of students who stop after step two. Along with the proportion of students, uh, we can look at the average predicted time in minutes at each cut scores. And again, the value blue line shows the estimates of average testing time given to cut scores. And there is a 0.6 minute, which is around 38 seconds difference between these two scores. Based on these two figures, we can decide that, we can conclude that given the 24 points, 6% uh, more students would stop after step two, and then the test length would be uh, 38 seconds shorter compared to having the cost score of 23. So, this for the our general procedure, and now we are going to talk about stopping rules in general. And our stopping rules were based on the rule scores at the end of step two. And if we put in a sentence, we can say that the test should stop at the end of step two if the student step two rule score is less than the cut score, and the Test should proceed to step three if the student's step two row score is equal to or larger than the cost scores. This table summarizes the relationship between the stopping rules and the proportion of students who do stop and the estimated average testing time and classification accuracy by each cost scores. And we can see that uh, the correct classification rates decreases as the cost score increases. However, the proportion of students who exit after step two noticeably increases as the cost score increases. The most important information Correct classification, and we can see that even though the correct classification rate goes down, but the differences are pretty small. So we can, uh, based on the figures that we saw, and then the information on these tables, we selected our binding stopping rules based on these three statistics, and the stopping rules should have a pretty accurate, the high, uh, 
my classification accuracy uh, minimize, minimize the testing time. So those final pass scores can be summarized in this table. And for example, if we going back to the grade one, the cut score is 24, and their stepping goals would be student with a step two goal score from zero to 23 will start at the end of step two, and only those students uh, with a step two goal score of 24 or more points would proceed to step three. Now, Mark will represent the initial result from the media that we collected in the so this slide does a nice job of illustrating the trade-offs uh, and the compromise that, that Kat noted at the beginning of this session where we know that uh, accuracy of classification is of utmost importance. We need something that provides a uh, really clear um, and uh, trustworthy identification of students as eligible for English language development services. Um, and schools and, and states need to have confidence in that decision. Um, it is high stakes for the students who are uh, being classified. And yet, the field uh, is uh, requiring something that's rapid and, and that can provide a very quick uh, identification. Uh, and so, um, you can see the process we went through was to think about, well, what are the costs and benefits here? How can we maintain uh, or minimize uh, the reduction in any classification accuracy while minimizing the burden uh, to students and to test administrators? So what we're looking for, and, and as uh, he showed us, where is that function uh, of cut score versus accuracy basically flat? And how far can we move uh, and slide over that cut score so we can stop uh, the test as soon as possible um, for as many students as possible to reduce the overall uh, testing burden? Um, and uh, to, uh, even at an individual student level, not require a student who has demonstrated in step two that they're probably not going to uh, do well or even benefit from answering additional test items because their classification won't change. So this was all work that was done last year. Um, we've done some surveying of states to ask about uh, how they're finding the screener this year. Uh, it was rolled out in August. It's still a fairly uh, new instrument and the data are still coming in uh, slowly. Um, ELPA 21 had released uh, an operational screener in uh, fall of 2017. Um, and you described those data as being the basis for our uh, simulation study where we were able to take uh, data from that first year administration uh, to characterize the population of students who participate in screening and to get a plausible uh, uh, scale score distribution to use in the simulation study. But that was a fixed line screener. It didn't have this uh, adaptive stopping design didn't have the option to identify non-participating students. Uh, so this uh, design is a little different from last year and not all of the states were using it. So we have two groups of students who are uh, in the mix uh, using the screener uh, in fall of 2018. Some of whom are transitioning from a paper only screener, all locally scored, uh, and some transitioning from the 2017 uh, of the 21 assessment, which was very long, which is part of what this design is trying to be responsive to. Um, and among those states, there are those who have worked with of the 21 uh, in 2017 administering the screener, felt like this was a, a much improved design, uh, felt like it was easier to administer. The, the difficulty of doing this on the fly scoring uh, seems to not be so great. Uh, most states were using screeners that required local scoring anyway. Um, we had been uncomfortable with that. Our, our summative test is scored entirely centrally. Uh, we were a little reluctant to roll that out, that responsibility out to the states too quickly. Um, but uh, Michelle's team did a nice job of thinking carefully about which rubrics do we have a lot of confidence in the ability of local uh, test administrators to apply consistently uh, and uh, also build into the data collection the reporting of those responses. So even the local judgments, we have the, the opportunity to do read behinds, which is again something that wasn't possible with some of the past uh, commercial screeners that are out there. So we'll actually be able to monitor uh, the, the uh, consistency of those ratings. This current design is now in use in all eight uh, all 21 member states. Um, I, I wish I had a daily total because it would probably be ticking up slowly as, as we're talking <laughs> here. Um, this was just rolled out in, in August, and as of 
a week, maybe 10 days ago, it was about 38,000 students uh, across the states. Not all the states are making this their, their only screener, so some districts are still opting to use uh, a prior screener. Uh, the late adopters may be waiting uh, to see how it goes for, the, for their colleagues in other districts. Um, so we expect that this number will grow. Um, some of the states are allowing for this kind of soft roll-in. Some of the, the districts or the states that only used a limited rollout last year are now going all in this year. And we expect the same thing may happen in the future. Um, as we hoped and anticipated uh, and uh, expected based on the simulation studies, uh, it's a relatively small percentage of students who require the full length screener. Uh, and again, the purpose uh, hopefully came through, which is that it's, it's actually quite uh, straightforward to identify a low performing student whose, whose English language skills are fairly limited. Um, we still need there to be a sufficient basis for us to feel comfortable calling this an English language proficiency assessment. So even though it might be possible in five items to do it, we want to report a uh, classification, a performance level in listening and reading and speaking and writing. So we needed some minimum test length uh, to, to have a defensible uh, individual's uh, student score report. Um, but for most students, the, the step two content is sufficient to provide uh, an accurate basis for those performance uh, uh, levels and also for a, a, a classification. However, as you saw, it's pretty difficult to differentiate the students at the highest uh, levels of performance. Uh, because so many students are being able to stop after step two, we got a, a fairly substantial reduction in time, uh, which is good for the students, uh, which is good for the test administrators. It's good for scheduling because uh, computer labs where these tests are administered are, are in high demand. Um, one thing we didn't mention is that but, uh, Michelle pointed out that there is central scoring for writing and speaking items that occur in step three. So there's also cost savings in tests that would have had to go uh, for central scoring that no longer have to go. And that's one of the major costs of administering uh, this assessment is the hand scoring that's required. So there's that cost savings too. And um, really significant uh, at the local level is the fact that most students' results will be available same day within minutes of submitting the test as opposed to going to the scoring center and coming back uh, a week later uh, in some cases. So that's a, a significant enhancement uh, for the, the uh, states that have been using the Alpha 21 screener. For some states that have been using a paper screener, they're like, well, we've already had immediately available results. But we feel like this is balancing rigor uh, and uh, the ability to uh, verify the consistency of scoring um, and at the same time uh, be responsive to the needs of the field for a timely and accurate uh, classification. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the initial returns. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for two months or so now with this new design, and we have uh, limited data. Uh, the states receive their data files from their test delivery vendors uh, and then share those uh, data files with us. So I'm going to talk about results from uh, a subset of these uh, 38,000 students, about 2,600 students. Um, and so this is the full diagram uh, of the screening process that starts with the home language survey and then we have the steps that um, Michelle identified. So overall, across all grade bands, about 4% of students um, are, are stopping at this step one. Um, that's actually higher than we expected. Um, and the 1% that Michelle mentioned earlier, that was completely based on state estimates. Um, so one thing that's kind of interesting is that states never knew what this number was. They never knew how many students were refusing to participate. And some uh, commercial screeners, the procedure, if a student is refusing, is just to fill in uh, incorrect responses or fill in scores of zero, just all the way down the answer sheet. So um, we feel like this is a number we need to explore further. We need to find out what do the states want to do with these? Do they want to encourage uh, states to retest? Uh, have the students sit for another administration. The good thing is they haven't gotten to any operational items, so they could very well sit for the same screener the next day uh, or a week later or at some point in time when the, the local officials feel like the student is ready to participate. But we think that this provides the most accurate description of the student. So Michelle mentioned level zero, but actually we call it proficiency not uh, determined, proficiency not demonstrated. Uh, and that accomplished two things for our states. Um, one is that it allowed us to report a result that was different from the lowest proficiency level. So in the past, the screeners would conflate non-participation with lowest ability by imputing zeros all the way down the answer uh, page. 
Uh, this is the most accurate description we can say about these students is we don't really know, we don't have any basis for reporting a proficiency level. We just know they didn't participate. And in the eyes of the test administrator, this was the fairest outcome to report about that particular test administration. Um, it also means that the local district is able to say, we have fulfilled our obligations. We attempted a test. Uh, we can't really force the students to do anything. We can't force an attempt uh, by the student. We can't force participation. We can force the school to abide by state procedures for this whole process. And this is now acknowledging what was always happening, but now it is a uh, sort of formalized uh, process for um, arriving at this outcome. And now we can differentiate between those who are uh, not proficient on the basis of not having participated and not proficient based on having participated and found to be at the lowest performance levels. So in addition to creating this category of students whose proficiency was not determined because of refusal or non-participation, the states adopted a rule for classification in which these students are eligible for English language development services. In other words, we're saying um, in the absence of evidence of the student's abilities uh, in these four domains, we're going to make the student eligible for services until we have evidence of proficiency. So 4.2%, higher than we expected, um, and uh, we'll see if the states want to refine the, the guidelines around when to use this category and also what to do following uh, this uh, initial outcome. Uh, across the grade levels, it varies quite a bit across grade levels, but uh, about 87% of students um, are being rooted here, uh, so they're able to stop after step one. So uh, they didn't refuse, so they proceed through this route, but then they complete the speaking task, they get hand scored, they complete the machine scored items in step two, and then the test delivery engine computes the raw score, applies the cut scores that he shared, and makes a determination in the case of 87% of students in this sample uh, that we have enough information. We can make a, a placement decision that this, these students are not proficient. They're, they're not close enough where we would need the additional uh, evidence in step three to make that decision. And so the remaining 9% of students will, uh, are taking the full uh, screener, steps two and three. Um, and this is a lot of information. You can see that the proportion of students uh, who continue is quite variable, as well as the proportion of students who are um, being identified as not participating or refusing, efficiency not determined. So row one are the students who stopped after step one. So that was the practice session. At the end of that session, test administrators say, no, this student is not able to be participating. We wouldn't get a valid result uh, by having the student proceed. They're exposed to zero operational items in this sample of 2,600 um, or, uh, or 2,046 uh, kindergarten tests. 46 students fell into that category, which was about 2% of all students. 95% uh, proceeded to step two, but stopped there. They were exposed to 26 uh, items, 44 items if they proceeded to step three in total, and that was a very small percentage. So it was 9% overall, but quite a bit lower in kindergarten, which is consistent with uh, the simulation data that uh, he presented. Um, and then that's uh, quantifying the benefit on the right side of the table. So this is showing how many students uh, were stopping at these different points in time after step one, after step two, or proceeding through the full test. Probably the best column to look at would just be the median time here. Um, so. The median time if you uh, stopped after step one was about three minutes, as, as Michelle uh, had indicated. That given the number of practice items and what's asked of the test administrator, this is about what we expected. It gets longer as you have more uh, uh, practice items, as the practice test gets a little bit longer, but uh, tends to be in that uh, three to five minutes range at the lowest grade levels. Uh, 12 minutes if the student proceeds uh, to step two, and then about double that if they proceed, if the student proceeds to step three. Because the vast majority, in this case, uh, about 95% stop at step two, the median time uh, for the full test is the same as the median time for those stopping the test at, at step two, about uh, 12 minutes at the median. So, uh, Similar tables, again, the ones I would pay most attention to are these proportions, or proportions stopped at step one and are non-participants. 
and what proportion have proceeded. And this 69% is, is pretty close to the estimate that, uh, that um, he predicted given the, uh, the cut score um, for uh, grade one. So higher, as we get higher grade levels, we see a higher percent stopping at uh, step one. You can see that the test is also getting longer. Um, the test, task types become a little bit more complex. The number of items is uh, not necessarily increasing, but you might have longer text passages that just take a little bit longer for the students. Um, so those median times are going up quite a bit. I mean, one slide that just pulls together all that information. So now we're not looking at step one, step two, step three. We're just looking at sort of the net effect of having these cut scores. If we have some students stopping at step one and some at step two, uh, in the proportions that we see in this particular sample. Um, this is what the median times look like across the six grade bands, from 12 minutes in grade kindergarten to about 37 minutes. This is still a bit, a bit longer uh, than our states would like, um, and is longer than some of the uh, existing screeners, commercial screeners that are out there. Um, but some of the feedback that we've gotten for those who are comparing their uh, the ALPA 21 screener to their old paper screener is that they feel like this is a much more rigorous evaluation of the four domains. Uh, that uh, some of the commercial screens were a little light uh, in assessing some of those other domains. Um, for those who are um, comparing to last year's ALPA 21 screener, they like that you have a significant number of students who aren't having to go through the full length screener. Um, and they also like that this is uh, drawing from the same item pool as the summative assessment. So students who are identified through this process as English learners will then retest on an annual basis uh, using a, a test that looks very similar. Uh, same task types, slightly different blueprint, uh, but assessing similar, uh, similar skills and reporting the results on the same uh, reporting scale and using the same definition of proficiency, which is different from uh, the commercial screeners, which uh, we're not tied to the standards uh, or performance levels. Um, this is just illustrating for one grade band, uh, grade kindergarten, um, the distribution of uh, students across raw score points. So, uh, and he showed a lot of results where she was plotting the raw score in step two. And we didn't explain why there's this focus on raw scores, and this is, <coughs> Uh, working within the constraints of a particular test delivery vendor's uh, system and scoring engine, um, under the hood in ALPA 21, there's a, a very sophisticated scoring machine uh, machinery. Uh, we use item response theory, multi-dimensional item response theory. We apply cut scores across all four domains uh, to get performance levels and a, an overall proficiency determination. None of those quantities were available for the application of this stopping rule. What was available was a raw score. That's, that's what could be computed on the fly uh, by this test delivery uh, engine. Uh, and so that's why we're using the raw score as a proxy for everything else, as a proxy for overall proficiency. And that's why we we're so concerned in, in understanding the relationship between a student's raw score and the possible distribution of uh, true proficiency levels. So, uh, the table goes on for our second page, but here are the students' raw scores uh, going down the page from zero to 12 points, uh, and here's how they were classified. Uh, this is not no longer true scores. We're not in simulation world anymore. These are the actual students uh, who participated this fall uh, in the sample of data that we have. Um, and you can see that consistent with the plots that Unhi shared, um, you, you go quite a ways down from zero to eight points. Uh, and all of the students would be classified as the lowest performance level. So a, a raw score of zero to eight points is incompatible with uh, a classification of progressing as well as a classification of uh, proficient. Uh, however, once you get to nine points on that raw score metric, again, just looking at the uh, step two items, we start to have some students who are being classified as emerging and some students who are classified as proficient. At nine points, the vast majority are being classified as, uh, as emerging, but some of them will have uh, a classification of uh, progressing. And it just depends on how did they get those nine points, which items were they getting correct, how were they distributed across uh, the four domains, and that's why we have some variability even within a raw score group. We go to the next page. Um, 
So we have uh, all those scores from 9 to 22, where you have the possible, actually 9 to 17, where you have a mixture. Some of the students are being classified as emerging, some as progressing. And then this range from 18 to 22, where everybody is classified as progressing. And that's this intermediate level of ability where you're not uniformly low, which you have to be to be emerging, and you're not uniformly high, which you have to be proficient. And this horizontal line is our cut score for, for kindergarten. Um, so it's only the students who have a raw score of 23, 24, 25, or 26 points that continue on to step uh, three. And that's because we need the ability to collect more data to be able to differentiate students who are uh, progressing from those who are proficient. Um, and so you can see that below that cut score, nobody's being classified as, as proficient. But there's among the students who proceed, and everyone below this line would have proceeded uh, to step three. Now we get this uh, breakdown um, across these two ultimate proficiency classifications. And these students would not be eligible for services, whereas these students would be. These would be our English learners, who would then begin receiving services and participate in annual testing. And these would be the ones who would be uh, considered initially fluent. So in terms of next steps, um, uh, we haven't talked a lot about the design of step one, but that's pretty critical. Some important things are happening in step one. We're wanting to be sure that it's providing sufficient uh, exposure and uh, practice with the uh, testing platform, uh, particularly because we have these very young learners um, who uh, are uh, unfamiliar with the, uh, with the computer-based test. Um, that's why we built this practice test into the uh, testing session, but we want to be sure that it's providing sufficient practice. We also need to know that it's providing a sufficient basis for the test administrators to make this important judgment about refusal or participation, and to make sure that it's being done in a consistent uh, and uh, fair way, that, that uh, the way that a test administrator in one state is uh, making that decision, the things that they're looking for uh, are the same that a test administrator in another state would be looking for. Um, we also need to explore uh, with the states what to do in those cases. Do the states want to formally uh, re recommend or even require that districts revisit that uh, student's initial placement? Um, we created this category of proficiency not demonstrated so students wouldn't be in limbo. In the event that they never return for further testing, we now have a mechanism for making an initial placement decision. But the initial placement decision is really just saying that we didn't get any testing data, so in the absence of testing data, we recommend that you provide services, make the student eligible for those services. Um, but it might be better, and we would probably prefer that the student actually be assessed. That, that would be a better basis for making this decision. Um, we'll be looking at hand scoring data as the results come in, and we'll uh, have a subset of those uh, teacher judgments that are being uh, uh, that are being read a second time, so uh, recordings and, and written responses um, will have a, a second read, so we'll be able to see uh, that the uh, speaking responses in step two are being scored consistently. Um, we, at the time when we were determining these cut scores for the 2018 screener, um, we had a, a form and a sequence uh, in, in mind, um, and it was based on what we thought was a, an appropriate ordering of di increasing difficulty. Um, and so what Anya was trying to do was to optimize the position in a fixed sequence of where to set that cut score. But we, we don't have to be limited in that way. We could imagine completely rearranging the sequence of tasks and finding which tasks are most helpful at getting at a, a step two based classification most quickly. So that would be something to consider. Is there a better placement of what's, what goes in step two versus step three um, uh, that uh, might mean that we could uh, exit even a greater number of students from, from the assessment earlier? Um, we just have one, we have, we have one stopping point at the end of step one that's mostly judgment-based, uh, and a second stopping point that's based on the raw score. But there's no reason that it couldn't be three steps or four steps or five steps. Um, I think uh, the teachers would probably say if, if the option is uh, 12 minutes or 24 minutes, they would be very happy if we could say, well, it could be 12 minutes, it could be 16 minutes, it could be 18 minutes, it could be 20 minutes, and we would just sort of stop uh, 
once we've collected enough information. Um, it's a little hard to do that when we're constrained by the criterion of a, of a raw score, uh, because that's a very uh, blunt instrument for uh, what is a multi-dimensional classification decision. Um, so we'd like to be working with uh, the field, including uh, potential test vendors on um, making some of the other quantities that are relevant to that placement decision available uh, on an interim basis throughout the test administration. So after the first item is administered, not only can we have the raw score, how many points the student got on that item, but we also would get their scale score at that point in time, their domain profile of performance levels at that time, and classification probabilities associated with those domain profiles and overall proficiency determination. So these are the things we're uh, working on, and I think with that, we can now transition into a time of discussion and uh, Q&A, and Kat's going to facilitate. Um, and I'd like to invite our panelists to join me up front, please. So um, first I'd like to start and ask if anyone in the audience has any questions for our panel today. Sure. <laughs> so one of the, you mentioned the trade-off between testing time and what was available on commercial screeners and the ability to make a judgment sooner. Seeing some of the attraction of the commercial screeners is also that they can be administered to more than one student at a time, or that teacher time other than as a test proctor is not required for the administration, which means that in intake centers and multiple students come in like in August or the end of May or June, they may find that there's less demand on a teacher administrator to provide the testing situation and get the score. What have you found about that trade-off then between the requirement that it's individually administered and the ability to group administer some other uh, assessment? Thanks, Jesse. I'd like to ask Michelle to lead us off with the, the response. And uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it is change is hard. And changing from paper and quick and this, that was a hard changeover for many TAs. And what happens though is that people say, well, I could get my results so fast and we could stadium administer. But actually the speaking and usually listening domains were one-on-one -on -one also. So there still was this piece, which is actually what we are trying to emulate this year. Last year, there was quite a bit of discontent about the amount of one-to-one -one for the screener because it was a longer fixed form and it was all one-to-one. -one. This year is a massive change up as designed. It just was not timely enough for last year to be able to switch to step one being two-thirds shorter than last year. So that was a giant improvement. And then just those four tasks at the beginning where if the student was determined to be, say, competent with the tech, that child can just work at his or her own pace from that moment on. So then another TA or the same TA could come in, have a step one, one-to-one -one somewhere else, and bring the next student in to do continue step two. So you, it has to be a team effort, but we actually improve that. And I actually have heard zero feedback this year about that any of the one-to-one -one being a problem because we greatly reduced it while accidentally scaring them that they had to score on the fly for speaking but they overcame that within a week. And now I think that we've probably shown with the new design that um, we can compete with that, those, that old style screener and have an improved screener at the same time. And I'd like to add to something Michelle said about the on the fly scoring. I conducted the train the trainer sessions for Louisiana last summer and it took about 10 minutes to train the TAs in the room on how to score the, the on-the-fly questions. <laughs> it was one of the easiest trainings I've ever done. We used a standard C1, do one, teach one model, and by the end of 10 minutes, they were teaching each other how to score. So it is a very successful and easy to apply rubric, and the feedback that we're getting from test administrators is feedback like, I screened four students at the same time. I just got one started, and then I got the next one started, and this one finished up, and I got the third one started. So in the space of an hour, this TA was able to screen four kinder students, which if you think about what Michelle just said about the stadium administration and the one-on-one, -on -one, that took hours of tour, hours. It was just the time was spent differently and in a different place, so it felt different. Margaret, anything to add to the response on this question? 
change in the field. <laughs> change Charles in our expert. Yeah. Change, change. Well, that is a good point. Though our screeners actually align to standards that exist and are written down and are adopted by our states, and that's a change as well. An off-the-shelf product or standards perhaps set in the 70s but not overly printed in the documentation of those screeners. But we begin to trust, right? We begin to say, oh, that student's a five and they go on to succeed, or this student's a three, and sure enough, they get to class and they act intermediate. Well, we do a little bit more than that with our test is we give them domain scores that are useful instead of, hi, you got a five, right? And hopefully you know what that means, and it didn't link to our standards, but this test does. So that also, I think, is a big plus. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Lee? Some more technical question, I guess, for Mark or Enki. Do you think that, um, so you focus primarily on the sum scores, total scores, because of constraints in the operational, the capacity of the operational vendor. Now, uh, but imagine a situation where no such constraints exist. Do you think that uh, going to, say, IRT-based scoring with the response patterns, would that add anything? Or is that, uh, based on your experience, that's no, no such difference? Is it going to, I mean, you, you, you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it, it would have value, especially if we imagine there being more than one stopping point. I think for one stopping point, we get a pretty good sense of where it needs to be. And I don't think we would come to a very different conclusion of where that best cut would be. Um, but if we were imagining evaluating after every subsequent item, uh, updating and, and right. judging where, whether we have collected enough information. And, um, unless we did simulations for every possible uh, test that could be administered for every, for every student, um, then having some criterion based on pattern scale scores or, or maybe even just the final classification probability has the probability that the student is proficient, fallen below some threshold or um, or probability the student is emerging, reached a threshold where we're comfortable making that, then, uh, then it'd be very easy to operationalize that and just say, well, if it falls below 0.1, then we're done. Whether that takes uh, 15 items or 30 items, uh, and just continually evaluate. Okay, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think that's a It's crude in a couple ways. So it's there's a, a huge variability in the difficulty of the items. So what it takes to get one point on this item is very different from what it takes to get one point on this item. Um, and it's also crude because what the standard setting panelists have determined is required in listening may be very different from what's required in writing, uh, where we expect uh, we might expect 40% of students will reach proficiency in this domain and maybe only 10% are reaching it in this domain, and so it's, it's the latter domain that's gonna be more limiting right. in the overall classification. That's that's where I worry the most about this one, one, one size instrument. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just a follow-up to that? Do you think that, the, as you said, crude nature of it increases, has more effect on false positives or false negatives? Or are you able to make that determination? Because it looked like where the cuts were being set was where where you were starting to get more false negatives, judging yeah. from the table, as opposed to false positives. Yeah, I think it, it means that we're we're having to include more students in that step three than if we had a, a finer tool. If, if if we could differentiate among so there there are students who have twenty two points on the raw score, um, some of whom, if we were looking at their scale scores or uh, profiles across the domains, we might rule out some of those uh, very easily. 
um, and we might want to redirect some of them to, to step three. When we have to treat them all as one group, that's where we have to be over-inclusive. So we're maybe using a, a more, uh, a, a wider net, uh, uh, mm -hmm. casting a wider net for students that are gonna have to continue because we, we can't really differentiate within those groups based on the raw score alone. So we tried to be conservative in the approach. We tried not to take away the opportunity for a student to demonstrate proficiency if that was still uh, in the realm of possibility. But you still want to give the maximum number of students the opportunity for ELL services if yeah. they could potentially offer. Yeah. So it is, it's a nice, it's a tension in the test design and it's a really delicate point and we had a lot of really thoughtful conversations with our states about the benefits of over versus under identification. Everybody falls on the side of over identification. It's, it's rare to find someone who says, no, no, let's risk it. Right. So we would rather potentially misidentify a student for ELD services than have a student miss that opportunity. And Mark, I want to ask a follow-up question to Jesse's as, as you're touching on this because I think this is germane. A lot of our SEAs and LEAs treat screening as a two-step process. You get a home language survey, you get a screener, boom, you're done. You have a vision of a more thoughtful and inclusive process that's more extensive for identifying ELs and specifically speaking about our step one which for 4.2% of our English learners, or potential English learners in this case, functions as an escape hatch from the test, right? So these students are too distressed to finish the test on this day. 4.2 of them, 4.2% of them, are now not able to be correctly identified. What do you recommend to then states and LEAs in terms of a more thoughtful and comprehensive approach to those students? You touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but you've been working on this so long, and it's so important, I want to give you the opportunity to say more. Well, so although as a psychometrician, I would love to vouch for the perfect accuracy of all of our tests, uh, we think it's important and, and one would hope that the states would sort of come into this with an assumption that of course there, there are going to be errors, but I feel like we need to sort of go out of our way to emphasize uh, uh, the limitations of an assessment, especially one that needs to be done quickly. Um, so being modest uh, in terms of uh, what we claim about what can be accomplished within this session uh, and to wrap around uh, the assessment safeguards for uh, situations in which uh, the result that's obtained may for various reasons uh, not reflect accurately the student's actual uh, language abilities. So uh, the, the Testing standards in education and psychology have long called for multiple measures as, as uh, the basis for any high stakes decision. Uh, so there's plenty of precedent for that. Um, and more recently, uh, the Council of Chief State School Officers uh, brought together a national working group to talk about how can we improve this process, not only of identification, but also of uh, exiting students from uh, English language development services. And one of the recommendations for the identification process specifically um, was that states, uh, in addition to adopting statewide procedures for initial placement, which this screener helps accomplish, as I mentioned, states are using many different screeners currently. Uh, so getting every, and, and ESSA requires them to move to a single statewide procedure, although that's still being interpreted as allowing for multiple screening instruments. Um, but in addition to having that common statewide procedure to also adopt a provisional classification period, a period of time uh, where the initial placement decision would uh, be subject to further scrutiny. We could say, uh, at the end of the screener, we need to make a decision. There's a federal requirement to make a placement decision uh, and to begin delivering services because the students are entitled to uh, those services uh, immediately. Uh, and yet, we know that there are some students for whom the, the test isn't providing a real confident placement. And so the idea of a provisional classification period would be to say, Let's uh, gather, continue to gather information. Remember, this, is, uh, this decision is oftentimes made before the student has ever stepped into a classroom. And the student's language skills, within a few weeks of the school year starting, will become more evident to, to someone. And you would absolutely uh, uh, trust the judgment of a teacher who says, I think the screener got it wrong. I would say, you're probably right. Tell me what you're seeing. And I would say, and I would say all we did was administer this test. You've been with the student you know, for these a uh, few weeks or months, um, and uh, you, you probably have good reason to, to question it. So 
Um, so we are encouraging states to do this, and um, I think the two barriers to adopting that recommendation would be number one, that we don't have good uh, standardized procedures for collecting additional evidence after the initial placement decision. So even though we would like to defer to the, the teachers, uh, we still need to meet this federal requirement for a standardized procedure and one uh, that can't be uh, misused and, and that uh, is, is trustworthy uh, and rigorous. So uh, one uh, obstacle I think is the um, lack of uh, readily available, uh, inexpensive, uh, standardized and rigorous uh, data collection tools. And they, the, what the National Working Group recommended was probably some sort of observation protocols that could be implemented in the classroom to complement. We don't just want to administer another screen or test language in the same way. We want to uh, collect evidence in another way that might complement these decisions. So one, we need to address the issue of the lack of availability of these instruments. The second would be, how are we gonna put these pieces of information together? We need um, methods for synthesizing the, the information. Um, and uh, so those are the two problems that we're trying to work on with the states currently is, uh, what kinds of data collection uh, can be uh, implemented? Um, and then once you have that information, how do you put the, the screener and this new evidence together rather than just having to weigh the two in, in, uh, in some way? Any additional questions for comments? Jesse? Sorry. <laughs> Just keep it going. <laughs> so I agree with the, the additional time and the observation. With particular caveat about teacher observation, in the teacher understanding and ability to assess academic language, the language needed to succeed in the content area, as opposed to social uh, interactional language. Uh, I've often seen where teachers have, have not been able to discern uh, those, and, and that conflates the issue. Yeah, great point. Yeah, and I think that's, that's something that we always consider. We, we have a valid statistical approach that's extremely rigorous and and for those purposes, we, you know, we, we think the screen is a good instrument for that, but those caveats are always uh, really important to remember. Uh, we've got about 30 seconds for a last question, if anybody has one. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today, and I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge with us today. Thank you.